Hello, whiskey folk. How are we all? Thursday night again, quarter to ten. It's 14th of March. Normally I say welcome to everybody, but the first thing I'm going to say on this live stream on the 14th of March is I'm going to say thank you to my wife. Thank you for allowing me to go ahead with this scheduled live stream, despite the fact that it's your birthday. Thank you so very, very much. I know we've delayed things generally. My kids are away on a week's excursion with the school, so our girls are not here with us eh, to enjoy my wife's birthday either, so it's quite a quiet affair for her. And she encouraged me strongly to just go ahead with the stream in order to do something at the weekend to celebrate her birthday. So I'm going to raise this glass and say happy birthday wife, thank you for tonight and thank you for your support in general. I love you. Happy birthday. She's a star. She really does put up with a lot and she's very, very patient. Everybody, thank my wife. Anyway, welcome everybody. Fantastic to see so many of you in. Over 90 of you in uh, at the start of the stream. Fantastic. I think it's going to be quite a busy one tonight. It's quite a, um, let's say, a, a thought-provoking theme, it seems. I've had a lot of direct messages and I've had a lot of responses to some of the posts that I've put out there already. Um, and I think it's quite cool and I think it's something to talk about. We'll get to that in a little while. And of course, welcome to you if you're sitting there and watching this on the replay as well. Always really, really encouraged by how many of you are willing to pick this up. I will try and put the housekeeping timestamps in the description box below, but sometimes that's difficult immediately after. It takes YouTube a little while to render the video, and for me to pick out the timestamps, it can sometimes be the next morning. But I will also try to keep this below two hours tonight. Let's jump into the chat real quick before I go on to the theme and what we're talking about tonight, and just to welcome some of you guys. Well, it's lit up already. I think there's lots of birthday wishes for Lynn as well. Fantastic. Uh, let's see who's in. Marcus Kreitner is in. He's saying, hi, Roy Acrovite, and happy birthday to you, Brian. Thank you very much, Marcus, and it's good to see you. Jez is in. Jez Batty. Amy is in. Gillian is in. Gillian, good to see you back again. I know I've not seen you for a little while. It may just have been uh, missing you but it's wonderful to see you in tonight. Uh, Daniel Vermas from Hungary, superb Daniel, good to see you. Greg is in as well, just started his own uh, videos, just some tentative toes in the water over on your channel, Greg. Great to see that, it's a great way to share whiskey, isn't it? Uh, Gregor as well, Gregor McQuee, good to see you. The Whiskey Bowman, my friend Chris from Cumbernauld, how are you, sir? Christine Deems is in, good to see you, Christine. Santa Cruz is here, cask mate, fantastic, Matthias, how are you keeping, are you doing well, my friend? Michael Porter, Christina Zarpoli, good to see you, Christina. Eric Waite is in, my friend, Eric from California, wonderful, thank you so much for joining, Eric. Chad Adams is in, uh, John Gunsel is in as well, good to see you, John. Trenny and C, fantastic, guys, I don't know if it's Trenny or C, I'm gonna guess it's C. Welcome in. McAllen Fine Rail, the doc from Germany. Good to see you, my friend. Amy is in as well. Of course, I've mentioned Amy already. I think she'll be bullying you into leaving some likes and thumbs up. Um, but only do that if you're enjoying yourself, of course, and enjoying the company of your fellow whiskey lovers. Mark Goins is in. Good to see you, Mark. Uh, Gus is in from the Midlands. Good to see you, Gus, as well. Fantastic photo share I saw on Twitter of uh, the samples that you've been trading with Paul. Fantastic stuff. Jimmy Jazz is in. Mark Broda, Scotch for Dummies. Mark Broda, good to see you, Mark. Jay Chung is in. George Kaplan, great to see you, George, as well. Ebhead Rolf from Norway. Scotch on the Bayou, Lee Rayner. Fantastic to see you, Lee, and thank you very much for your recent Patreon support as well. It's fantastic to welcome you in there. Kevin Grant, my cousin Kevin is in. Good to see you. Hoyt is in. Mikey Hay, Nigel Slynn, Graham Young, Robert Primo, Jay. I've mentioned Jay already. Steve A, good to see you, Steve. Andy, Art Baggy, fantastic uh, direct message you left on the, the Patreon post, Andy. Uh, I might share a little bit of that later on. I enjoyed it getting your input on tonight's theme. Scott is in Kilted Moose. Great to see you, Scott. Hope you're feeling a wee bit better. I know you were a bit upset uh, with a virus during the week. I uh, hope you're uh, in good shape. Graham Stewart saying, Evening, Roy. That's a new name, Graham. I think. Nice to welcome you in, and it's fantastic to see so many of you here, 132 of you. So let's talk about this concept uh, that, that um, I wanted to talk about tonight, and I have to say that this was inspired by um, a Jason, um, Jason from Malt Review. He's kind of got this thing going this month about opening bottles, and I think that ties in with a tasting that he held 
at the Fife Whiskey Festival at the weekend. I was through in Fife to attend that festival. It was a fantastic day, really laid back day. I like that festival, I like the vibe, I like the size and scale of it, I like the feeling. Um, but we went along and I was fortunate enough to squeeze into uh, Jason's Fife Firsts um, tasting. And it's kind of celebrating the renaissance of whiskey, lowland whiskey, specifically in that region of Fife. So we've got uh, Eden Mill, we've got King's Barns, we've got Lindors, we've got, uh, of course, Daft Mill. And just a sense of kind of rejuvenation in the, the whiskey scene there. And, and in, in a kind of way to mark that and celebrate that, Jason had some bottles, uh, contemporary bottles um, from these new distillers. And uh, he also had um, some bottles from the past. But just to give you an idea about how he puts his money where his mouth is, two of the bottles that he opened during the tasting were Daft Mills. Uh, one of them was the summer release, uh, uh, actually the, the one that was released last year, but uh, the summer release, we're talking about a release of summer dist distillate. Um, but he also opened a signed, a Francis Cuthbert signed inaugural bottling as well and shared it with everyone at that tasting. This was not an expensive tasting. This was a very reasonably priced tasting. Um, so when people are, are, are taking those steps, you know, what bottles that could potentially be significantly high value to the point where you could argue the whiskey can't really live up to its value. You know, it's um, they've outpriced themselves almost. He was willing to pop these and share them with people that otherwise would be completely excluded from the experience. And I found that really cool. And it's kind of been making me think generally about uh, buying habits in whiskey, drinking habits, sharing habits, collecting habits, hoarding habits, but specifically thinking about how I'm changing. Um, so yeah, I want to touch on that. I want to share with you how I've changed in the last, as recently as just the last year or two. Um, and how my relationship with the bottles coming into this house is changing as well. Um, and I think that a lot of you will also um, be able to relate to some of the issues that we cover and talk about. Uh, let's see what you're saying. Skilder Moose is saying, feeling much better and having my first dram since last Friday. Fantastic, Scott. I wonder what you're sipping tonight. I bet you it's something delicious as well. Um, See if anybody is trying to get my attention tonight as well. Obviously, just try to highlight Aquavite. If you write Aquavite, it should be highlight, highlighted for me anyway. Um, using that symbol always helps. But uh, the Whiskey Rev has joined us for a little while tonight as well. And hopefully, he'll be able to get uh, some messages to me uh, if I am missing them. Talking of which, he said, uh, Anthony Donahue, uh, Donahue, sorry, do you... Uh, how do you feel about novelty whiskies? He's asking, like Game of Thrones uh, offerings. It's a good question. Um, yeah, wow, I've missed quite a few messages already. Thanks, Rev. Thanks for sending them through. It looks like I've actually missed a super chat in already um, from uh, Caskmate. Caskmate has bought me a virtual dram. He buys me so many of these virtual drams. I'm going to struggle to pay you back for these if we ever meet, Matthias. But thank you very, very much, my friend, and thank you for your virtual dram. So if I go back to... Um, if I go back to Anthony's question, how do I feel about novelty bottlings? It depends. I kind of feel okay about the Game of Thrones ones because, for the most part, um, well, put it this way, I bought a Klein Leash and I also bought a Lagavulin. I got to try them thanks to my friend Gregor. He sent me some samples from the US releases. So I kind of felt comfortable buying those editions. Um, and I felt that at retail, they were kind of reasonably priced. So being a novelty themed whiskey and that collaboration with HBO, um, potentially uh, it could have been a bit more expensive at retail, I'm talking about. Um, but it was reasonably priced, I felt. And I think that it had to be because they were trying and targeting the whiskies to, towards potential uh, new people, new palates, people that were getting into whiskey as new whiskies. So I was okay with those specifically. But there are some novelty whiskies that I care less about. Um, I don't know if I would call Proper 12 a novelty whiskey, for example, uh, Conor McGregor's. Um, 
but uh, that's not really a, a kind of sipping whiskey. So it's not really a whiskey that I would engage with. It's kind of one that's more suited, I think, to using as a base for mixers. Um, so kind of celebrity sponsored whiskies or celebrity endorsed whiskies seems to be popular for rock bands and things like that to bring out their own releases and things as well. I kind of would rather it was about the whiskey, not not the kind of theme or celebrity or sponsorship deal behind it. But of course, that's me. It's where I am in whiskey and things. So I don't know if that's what you mean by novelty whiskies. Hey. Novelty and whiskey, they don't seem like words that should uh, sit easily together, right? Uh, Colin Bob, that looks like a new name. Colin Bob has just uh, uh, bought me a virtual dram and he's saying, hi guys, first time I've managed to catch the live stream. A pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to welcome you, Colin. Fantastic. And thank you very, very much. I'll take the last sip and tell you what this is I have been sipping. And say cheers, Colin. Nice to welcome you in. So I had this on a live stream a few weeks back. Uh, this is the 19, uh, late 80s, early 90s uh, Johnny Walker Black Label. And I'm constantly struck by how rich and sweet, sugary fruit that is. Um, it's clearly a different animal from the Johnny Walker that we know today. Now, of course, is that because of the whiskies they used to put it together back then? Is it because it's changed in the glass over time? Who knows? But it's definitely different, significantly different. Um, another virtual dram has just come in as well. I'm going to have to pour something quickly to... Uh, what do I have here? What do I have that I can pour? I've got a wee bit of my uh, long row red Cab Franc left here. I'll pour a wee tiny bit of that, but it is peated. So I won't pour too much of it. And this uh, virtual dram that's came in, yes, virtual dram that's came in is from Amy in the States. Hello to 150 or so of the finest people on YouTube. Roy, have a dram with Lynn for her birthday. Amy, thank you so, so much. You're wonderful. You and George together are wonderful eh, and reassuring supporters. Thank you. So nice to have you here. Thank you for the virtual dram. Oh, the very generous virtual dram as well, Amy. We did go out tonight. We had some dinner tonight. Because the girls are away, my youngest son came out with us. It was just the three of us. Um, we went out for dinner in town and uh, we had a nice meal and things uh, and came home quite early. So we have had uh, some time together to mark our birthday. But like I said, the kind of celebration and the cake and cards and all that kind of thing is going to wait till the weekend. But um, I'll let her know uh, that you said you shared those kind words. Uh, Amy, thanks very much. So yes, um, that's what I poured um, as I was setting up here, that Johnny Walker. Um, and Gregor is saying, congrats on 8K, Roy. You belted you 8K evangelists and counting. Yes, the channel uh, managed to break 8,000 subscribers recently. It's fantastic. I think I said this on the Patreon only stream uh, just last week. I think it's getting to the point that the channel is really at quite a nice size just now. It's kind of sitting at a nice sweet spot. Um, I'm in, and uh, I think I'm quite enjoying the size of it. It's just about manageable, right? Um, the live streams can occasionally get quite busy, of course. Um, um, and it's obviously, I've got to kind of keep coming up with little ideas and things to try and manage that. But it's kind of just, it's just the way it is. I will try and interact with you as much as I possibly can. But I know that you guys love interacting with each other, right? I can see the chat as I'm getting set up here. I can see everybody speaking to each other and you you obviously start to know each other very, very well and you've started to exchange samples and even start a, at least one whiskey club, talking of which the London Whiskey Club. Um, I see that Jez is in tonight. There'll be a few others in as well. Uh, Jason Whiskey Wise will be in a wee bit later. Maybe James Hope will be in. Um, there's there's a lot of familiar names from this lounge This uh, of you guys are. Uh, this community here that have got together and uh, the London Whiskey Club seems to be thriving. They have a Loch Lomond tasting coming up on the 20th of March. So that will be, uh, that's Wednesday night next week, I think. Um, I don't know if that's fully booked or sold out or whatever. And then in April after that, on the 17th of April, they have a McMira tasting as well. 
Um, if you're interested in getting together with those guys and seeing what they're about, uh, they're very open uh, to new members and uh, I guess they're looking for new members. Uh, get in touch with Jez, uh, who's in here tonight, or uh, anybody from the London Whiskey Club. They're all over social media. You get them on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, and like I say, the guys have often hang out here as well. In fact, I've probably got an email. I'll ask Jez to put an email in the lounge chat if you are interested in getting in touch with them. Um, but yes, uh, while there's so many of you in, it's kind of worth mentioning that if you do have a club or an idea to form a club and you think there are people nearby you and you think I can help, let me know. It would be fantastic if people are getting together in the real world and sharing whiskey. I've also had a super chat in from, from Jason Ustar. Thank you at the Mash and Drum. He's saying congrats on your 8K, well deserved and happy birthday to your wife. Jason, well done my friend. Let us know if you've got a live tonight or was it last night? Um, I'm not very sure I've not been keeping up. Uh, quite a bit busy just now, so let us know if you're going live later, Jason, and thank you very much for your virtual drama, my friend. Toby is saying he's also a member of the London Whiskey Club too. Fantastic, Toby. Loch Lomond isn't sold out. So that's next week on Wednesday night. And let me tell you, Loch Lomond, um, that's a distillery that's suddenly on the map again. The, the whiskies I've been trying uh, the Standard Loch Lomond and Inchmorans as well have been really something. They're character whiskies. They are character whiskies. And Loch Lomond don't seem uh, reluctant to put out a whisky with a bit of uh, kind of a, a kind of dirtier, more characterful, old school style of whisky. Some of their whisky is very much that. So if you like your whiskies with a bit of flavour and uh, savoury, sour type notes in it, Loch Lomond is doing fantastic things. I've been really, really impressed with them recently. Uh, Vin is in from No Nonsense Whiskey. Good to see you in. He's saying he's trying to set up in Coventry. Good for you, Vin. Wes Jolly, you start. It's good to see you in as well. As well. It's, it's fantastic to welcome you here always, Wes. Um, uh, he's part of the Proper Poor Whiskey Club. Is that the name of your club, Wes? Simon Ray, fantastic. He's saying, talking of birthdays, happy birthday to your wife. Thank you very, very much. I hope she's watching tonight. Hello. I don't think she is. I think she's busy uh, doing other wee projects tonight, but I'll pass along all your kind wishes. If she, if you are in Lynn, if you are watching, just say thank you. Um, and Whiskey Crusaders, congrats, Roy, on 8K, and Whiskey Clubs are fantastic. We are close to 150 members now. Fantastic. I forget that name in the logo, Whiskey C Crusaders, is familiar to me, and I don't know why. But I'll say thank you very, very much for your virtual dram as well. I'm going to need to get a third dram poured already, and we're only 15 minutes in. Cheers, Whiskey Crusaders, and good luck with the growth of the club. And Zach Andrews as well. <laughs> I can't keep up. <laughs> How to keep me drinking, right? Mm -mm -mm. Okay, I'm going to get a clean glass. I'm going to pour one of the bottles that I really want to try tonight. It's the open one, Springbank Local Barley from last year. Wonderful stuff. Quite expensive for a Springbank. But there are reasons for it. And I'll raise a glass to Zach Andrews. He's saying, happy birthday to Lynn. I'm enjoying a Springbank Local Barley 10-year sample you sent me. Fantastic. It's so wonderful. Well, this is the 10-year, so we're actually drinking the same thing. Fantastic. Thanks again. You're very welcome, Zach, and I'm very glad you're enjoying it. Zach was the winner of a, a care package from me uh, in a giveaway last year. It took me a long time to put it together and send it out to him, um, but hopefully it was worth the wait, Zach, and you're enjoying things like that nice wee spring bank that I uh, sneaked in there too. Slant it. Don't know what you're getting from this, Zach, but it always reminds me and it's only on the finish as well that you realise it's cast strength when that spice comes in always makes me think of spiced butter. Uh, 
It's cracking whiskey, really cracking. And I'm going to just put a little spot of water in it because I know this guy enough to know how well it does with a wee splash. So, um, Fife Whiskey Festival on Saturday was fantastic. I've already mentioned that. We went through with the Glasgow Whiskey Club uh, bus. We hired a bus from Glasgow and uh, went through together. It was great fun. Um, and it really got me thinking about this concept of uh, opening bottles. Two years ago on my website, I did a post about um, something I called open bottle syndrome. And it was that idea that I was so excited about trying new whiskies that um, as soon as I bought a new whiskey and I got it over the, the threshold, um, it was popped and uh, tasted almost immediately. Certainly within the first couple of days of owning it, the whiskey rev was the very same. He used to do the same thing. And when he, when we got together on our whiskey Wednesdays, when we when he was living here, he doesn't live here anymore, um, yeah, that's what we used to do. We used to share our new whiskies. And it gave me a bit of a problem because um, when I wrote that blog post two years ago, I had 116 bottles of which 105 were open. Far too much, so many of you will say. But you need to understand that back then, and still now, I was sharing a lot of whiskey and I was exploring whiskey. So I was getting through a lot of whiskey and I was enjoying it and I was enjoying having all of those bottles open. And it's because of all of those bottles being open that I have things like recycled reviews and, and things now. Um, but th things have moved on a little bit. And I'm happy to report that uh, I am opening less, but only in terms of ratio. <laughs> I have much more whiskey than that now. But instead of having 90% open, I've only got 50% open. So open bottle syndrome is still an issue for me, but I'm doing different things with whiskey now. I'm opening it and I'm sharing it with you guys. I'm sending samples here, there and everywhere. I'm interested in trying all the new expressions that's coming out and it's dizzying how many new expressions are constantly being released and coming out. It's, it's impossible to keep up. And I'm just speaking about scotch, forget about world whiskies and bourbons and it's incredible. Um, so it's changed. And what's happened now is I am starting to count the sealed bottles. So I have inadvertently, without thinking about it, I've become a collector. And I used to have an open bottle collection, but now it's mixed. And I wonder if I'm becoming a hoarder because there are some things that I have bought purely because I know you can't get them anymore or they're about to disappear. That's hoarding behavior. There, the Johnny Walker Black that I opened at the start of this stream, this was made at a time when Johnny Walker was able to reach in a vast depth of stock because it was on the back of the whiskey loch during the 1980s. Whiskey popularity had, had taken a nosedive. Not many people were, um, it kind of went out of fashion. People were into sparkling wines and vodkas and cocktails and the fashions had changed. Um, and blended whiskey took a nosedive. That meant that when they were putting this together, there was probably much better quality stock available to make a much better product. They were drawing from something called the whiskey loch as it, as it became known. I think that we're fast approaching a scenario now where there is very much a whiskey loch but it's a glass loch and it exists in our collections at home in our cupboards and in our cabinets and goodness knows where's, where we store it. I'm, I'm, of course, not everybody is doing this and it depends where you are in your whiskey journey and how long you've been buying whiskey to enjoy. But I think if you're not careful quite quickly, you can end up, you know, in the scenario that you do start to hoard it. Now, of course, we soothe ourselves by the idea and the concept that the whiskey is appreciating in value. And we're in a kind of win-win scenario. We can open it and drink it and share it. And if we don't, and if we have to liquidate it or tap into some cash or whatever at some point, we can swap it, sell it, trade it, whatever we want to do, take it to an auction at some point in the future. 
I'm wondering though how healthy it is. I've got some opinions and ideas of my own, but I was I'm interested to hear about yours. McAllen Final Rare is saying, Well, you were in Fife. I was at the Whiskey Time Frankfurt show last weekend. Please note the abbreviation. <laughs> yes, Whiskey Time Frankfurt. Uh, Brandon Bullard, good to see you, Brandon. That looks like a new name. He's saying, I have seven open bot I have severe open bottle syndrome, but I, I've only got around 70 at home. Yeah, I know, but that's at the point. Probably that you know that that's you exploring, right, Brandon? I would guess that you've managed to collect seventy and you've been popping them open and enjoying them. Uh, training C is saying Acrovita, it's not hoarding; it's smart. Yeah, I understand. I understand that it's smart, but what's happening is that there's this swell of whiskey, and at some point. That's just going to, it can't just continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and the value continue to rise and rise and rise. There has to be a saturation point when there's just so much whiskey being traded out there that the secondary market starts to correct itself a little bit, don't you think? And I'm wondering that sometimes the, the practice of hoarding, and I'm not judging at all here, absolutely I'm not judging because as I've already admitted, I'm just as guilty myself. Let's imagine you go into a store right now and you see five bottles of Glengoyne 15 year old. And Roy on his live stream two weeks ago told you that Glengoyne 15 is just about to be discontinued, which it is. You see it there, you like it, you know it's one that you love. And it's at a fair price. It's still flat retail. It's at a good price. Are you tempted to buy two, maybe three? Are some of you tempted maybe just to take what's on the shelf there, knowing that you might never be able to buy it again? Because that can be argued that that's a smart move. You know, it's a whiskey that you enjoy, so you're going to make sure that there's whiskey there available for you. But you're taking it away from other folk as well. It might just gather dust in your cupboard or somebody else is walking in later that day, the next day, whenever, looking for Glengoy 15, genuinely wanting to open it, share it, drink it, enjoy it. And you've kind of, and I guess that that's just the nature of things. That kind of thing goes through my head. Is that a crazy thought? Kilton Moose is saying, I had been waiting to open some bottles on a special occasion. That's right, I just, that's, I don't imagine that I'm going to have enough special occasions, Scott, which never arrives, absolutely. And then starts to prey on your mind, and the longer you keep some, the harder they are to open, as the value increases, especially those limited edition ones, or the ones that are long gone, right? The value increases, and perhaps the value outstrips the whiskey. The whiskey can't live up to what it's actually worth anymore. So then, you know, you suddenly you have a ball and chain bottle that you can't open, or it's very difficult to open. You, re you need a really special occasion, or what you need to do is just trade it for something that perhaps you will open. And he's gone on to say, no more. They are all getting opened, <laughs> shared, and enjoyed. Well, that's the kind of thing that excites me, I have to be honest, um, because we do, let's face it, whiskey only appreciates in value, um, for the most part, unless it's kind of a special edition Macallan or something, right? If some of them, at least, are being opened tasted and raved about. People are enjoying these and saying, this is not only limited, this is not only special, this is a good whiskey. Um, and I think when people are drinking it and sharing the, the news about it, the kudos builds. Eric is saying, Aquavite, but a lake of wine or whiskey is what people are not buying. And is the result of overproduction or mass production and perhaps not as artisan as today, so uh, it could be mostly plonk. I understand what you're saying, Eric. Um, if there is, uh, like the whiskey lock I'm talking about from the 80s, um, and it wasn't that it was bad quality, perhaps you could argue that it was starting to get a wee bit more homogenized as, it, as the argument goes for modern whiskey. Um, but it ended up being good whiskey. And of course, with whiskey, the longer you leave it, the better it, it comes, you know, as a rule of thumb, let's say the better it becomes. But if this whiskey is being locked away in storerooms, garages, basements, locked away in cupboards, purely with the idea that whiskey's a good investment, 
I think it's it's difficult to imagine how much there actually is. And at some point that has to be liquidated. And it and I imagine that it's all going to start to happen at the same time. So the prices can't continually do this. They will continually do this as long as people are squirreling them away and they're being hidden from sight. The prices do this. But as soon as people start to sell all that again, the prices are, are going to drop. My argument is that if you're buying for investment, I'm not going to judge. Of course, you should, by all means do that. But if you're buying with the idea that you're going to open it and share it and you're waiting for a special occasion, why shouldn't that special occasion be a Tuesday night? Just consider opening and sharing some, perhaps with me. <laughs> Daniel Vermas is saying it's a bell curve. Yes, because of course, whiskey's fell good to see any saying aqua vidi. That's why I'm buying samples a lot now rather than full bottles. It allows me to try without having hundreds of open bottles. There's lots of ways to do it. And that's what I, Andy in his comment touched upon. There's so many angles to this whole thing. It's almost like I could have split it up into at least two different streams talking about open bottle syndrome, like you're talking about there, uh, Phil. And then, of course, this this idea of uh, the, the new modern whiskey lock being locked in glass, the glass lock. Travis is in. Travis Soders is saying, I have a rather large collection and I don't have any that aren't opened unless it's a backup bottle. I just enjoy sharing too much. Exactly, Travis. If you're really enjoying whiskey, if you're on your journey and you love sharing it with people, it's difficult to keep them sealed, right? Rolf is saying, I think it's worse than the limited bottles are hoarded by flippers and collectors. If you like a standard release, I think it's okay to get a few bottles for later. Yeah, there's different things. Um, and I'd be curious as to how people define a flipper as well. Whiskey Bowman Chris is saying, it's a trap. Roy wants us to open ours, so his are worth more. Well, that's the thing, Chris. The reason that I picked Springbank Local Barley tonight is that there's arguably, you know, it's not like a red hot whiskey, but it's one of those kind of steady whiskies that if you put it aside and kept it sealed, you're going to get your money back on it. You're probably going to make a little bit on it as well. You're probably going to make enough that you're going to be able to um, turn a single bottle into two or more bottles somewhere down the line. So what I'm going to do is um, obviously instead of leaving this, I took this from my cupboard. This was not in my cabinet. Um, this came to me through Scott Monroe, Kilted Moose, who's in tonight. He happened upon a shop in Glasgow that still had a couple left on the shelf. I thought I'd missed them. I thought they'd all gone. It's, as everybody knows, the Springbank allocation in the UK is miserly. Um, it's terrible that you know we live in the country where it's produced um, in Britain here, and uh, there's always a fight for all the special Springbanks. Now, to be fair to Springbank, they do put it out there at retail. They're not greedy on their prices. The prices are always reasonable. This is an expensive bottling, but I'll touch on that in a second. But there are retailers and uh, online retailers out there that are a wee bit greedy, and uh, they immediately start to match secondary prices from the get-go, which I think is poor. They're making an assumption that Perhaps I'm a flipper that I'm interested in the secondary market when in fact I'm a drinker and they take the whiskey out of the hands of the drinkers then or they put it in the hands of more well-off drinkers, I would say. There was a site recently in the UK, um, a few days after I picked up my latest Springbank 12-year-old cast strength for £60, my local retailer and good spirits company uh, sold it to me at retail. Uh, I think that, no, that's not where I got that. I think that came to me actually from the alchemist, Sevi. He picked it up when he was out shopping, but he picked it up at retail um, and we paid retail for our Springbank cast strength. Uh, and just a couple of days later, we found it on a, a site in the UK, um, the Whiskey Barrel. Um, and the Whiskey Barrel were, were selling that same bottle for £150. And when confronted about it, they said that they were matching secondary market prices. Now, they're free to do what they want. They can do that. It's their business and they can run their business as they like and attempt to make as as profitable as they can possibly make it. We can do what we want with our business as well. 
Malt Mariners. Good to see you in, Malt Mariners. This looks like a new name. He's saying, Aquavidia, I think, is a very sensible thing to think, and it's a point of view that I wish more people would think about. Gregor is saying that it's because some special occasions did never happen, did never appear, and some warning health alerts came that I've decided to open more bottles and high-end ones. That's right. Life is short, Gregor. Definitely. Um... Uh, Adam, uh, that, is that Adam Christopher then? Adam Extifer? Adam Christopher? He's saying Aquavite, nice to welcome you in, Adam. He's saying, sincerely appreciate the ethical thinking about this topic, but we share our, hand, our hordes now, so are we doing our part in evangelizing? 5% hard to opens, I'll allow it. I would say that in my collection, there was the 5% used to be a fairly solid figure. There was probably 5% that I would have to think about opening. And I would certainly want to open it with uh, people that I would get a, a bit of excitement and they would appreciate it and I could enjoy it and share it with them. Um, but I think it's, I'm worried that I've slipped beyond that now and I'm worried I need to tackle it from the other end. Maybe, maybe buy a little less, open a little more, share a little more. Um, uh, because it becomes a you know a, a space issue and and it brings a level of anxiety into whiskey that I was quite happy that it didn't exist before. Um, this phone is buzzing away. I'm just going to make sure that the rev isn't. Um, yeah, there's loads of messages coming into me from the rev. Wow, I'm not keeping up tonight, am I? Let's see what I've, I've missed here. Dr. Matt Bishop is saying, Aquavite, interesting to see more expensive bottles being sold with 5CL tasting drams alongside and <laughs> to encourage it being sealed, right? <laughs> Which is emphasizing the hoarding value. If no tasting dram given, people would have to open them to taste it. That's a good point, Matt. I mean, it's a nice thing that they were doing that, but yeah, it does encourage the idea that you can keep the full bottle. Um, Sealed. The last drop is saying you're buying bottled memories. You absolutely are. When the whiskey's open and you're sharing it, um, there's so, so many whiskies that have very, very vivid, vivid uh, memories associated with it. And again, that, that kind of probably encourages you to buy more so you can continue to relive those positive, enjoyable memories, right? especially when those bottles are, are discontinued. George Kaplan had been saying to me, 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 I hear you about the same here. I have a bottle at about 40% now. I've had two drams from. The rest sent out samples because it was so good. That's fantastic as well. It's what I like to do. I like to, if I can't share here, if I can't share because the people aren't coming here anymore, I like to try and find a, uh, ways that that I can, you know, send it out. It becomes expensive to ship it through the post, right? And you can't ship it to everywhere. It's not legal and things. But you still have the ability to share it. But there is nothing better than sitting in the same space as someone, breathing the same air and sharing, having a shared whiskey experience. With a wee bit of water in this, the spice really shines in this local barley. Wonderfully malty, and when I say malty, it's it's like a it's like a bread cereal note, like a a doughy type thing. Can't get I can't get past the butter thing. I always get a buttery thing from this. Mm. Pastry like a custard, a vanilla custard and pastry thing, and the spice. And it tells me which, which barley strain this is. This is Belgravia. I think uh, the first two was, was it Prisma or Prism? And beer. And I think the newest one is a much more um, commoner garden barley, which is Optic. So what I'd like to do is... Um, rather than hoard a local barley in the cupboard. Now, I don't have any more of these. I only get, like I say, the allocation of these in the UK is so miserly that we're lucky to get our hands on one. 
So here we have it, 95 pounds, cast strength spring bank, and this is a nine year old. So that's quite expensive. But we have to consider, you know, local barley. I mean, I can't imagine being a farmer in the west of Scotland anywhere, but it can't be easy down in Campbelltown, right, to get a decent yield out of a barley field, a barley crop. And that's certainly true. So it's not really lush, uh, easy, flat, fertile lands down there to grow barley. So it's probably expensive to grow it in the first place. And then the process of local barley as well, lower yield, uh, different strains and things that are harder to work with. And then obviously to manage that batch through uh, to maturity so they can bottle it. All of that costs a wee bit more. And these these additions are never more than, it's kind of similar to the long row red and batch uh, sizes. It's probably about 9,000 bottles at a time. But I'd kind of like to just try it based on our Rob Whiskey in the Six, uh, his comments were that he'd tried a recent, I'm not sure which local barley it was, I apologize, Rob, uh, but he tried one from the bottle, he tried, tried it from the neck pour. Um, and he remembers the last one he tried, he really enjoyed and he wasn't connecting with this new one he tried. And then he went back uh, some days later and of course it had time to relax and open up a bit and he admitted that he was loving it again. So I thought it would be good to use the local barley as an example to fit well with this theme. Gregor is saying, love that nine-year-old Aquavite. I haven't tried it. That's not true. I've tried it, but I don't have a memory of it. Um, I think it was, uh, it was either at the Glasgow Festival last year, was it? Can't remember where I tried it. And I've certainly not tried it back to back with the previous one. And I think before the 10-year-old, the I think there was an 11-year-old, and before that was a 16-year-old. It's getting a wee bit younger each time as well. Jez is saying, I have never bought for resale purposes, only to buy to drink. I have 40 birthday coming this year. We'll be open a St. Magdalene whiskey, 1979 with good friends. Wow. Is that the rare malts? 1979, St. Magdalene, Jez. You are in for a treat with that whiskey. It needs water and it needs time. It's uh, even at even at its age, it's very high ABV. I think it's I think it's north of sixty percent ABV going from memory. But I paid a lot of money to try a dram of that in Edinburgh one night, and I sat I sat with it for about an hour. You're in for a real treat with that whiskey. We can't find a rare Saint Aquavite. I think the cost of barley actually can't be really relevant for high end whiskey production. Um. Perhaps. I mean, if you if you look at £95 for a bottle of whiskey, the cost of the barley is probably quite small, but the producer, you know, they're not getting £95, right? I think the tax is, is considerably higher. Um, yeah, some people will make a decision um, and they will look at Springbank local barley and they'll say, wait a minute, I know it's cast strength, hey, but it's a nine-year-old, it's a 10-year-old and it's £95 a bottle, I'm not interested. I think that when you try it and when you get your head around it and you start to get to know the whiskey, I think you would probably start to consider that it is worth the money. It is a high-end whiskey. Dram Session is saying, is a neck pour worse than the rest of the bottle? Not all the time, Dram Session, but usually, my in my experience, first pour from the bottle can often be a wee bit tight still a wee bit wound up and claustrophobic and it needs time just to mellow out, it needs the air, it needs to breathe a little bit. And what you tend to find is that when you've got a bit of air in the bottle, it can breathe. When it's poured and left left to rest in the glass um, for a little while, it's got time to breathe as well. Let's stick our nose in this wee spring bank. Oh, wow. So I'm immediately looking for the kind of pastry and butter thing again, and it's there. This is this is, smells a bit lighter. It smells uh, like a bit like a kind of grassier, florally. No, not as spicy as this one. I've put water in this. It smells a wee bit richer. Again, that might be exactly what I'm talking about, just just with uh, with with this being the first pour, pour from the bottle.
So on the, on the, the, the Springbank thing is there. There's a, there is a Springbank DNA in this, but it's much quieter. I don't understand why. Springback funk isn't is obvious in either of these two drums. I've always been struck by that that with this one. And there's just the tiniest hint of it here. This is 57 point something as well, 57.7%. Yes, it's cast strength. You can tell it's high ABV. You wouldn't place it as high as that. For a nine-year-old whiskey, it's very, very nice, very easy, very accessible. It's a soft expression of Springbank. People that don't enjoy Springbank or enjoy the kind of uh, you know, the the sourness or the Springbank funk as it's referred to, I think they could easily connect with this. It's not, it's there, but it's very muted. There's a little bit of a kind of dusty note on here, like a, like a cereal dust thing. Maybe just a wee bit tight. Come on, it's, it's fantastic whiskey. It's wonderful whiskey. Is it 95 pounds? It's up to you to decide. If you can get your hands on a sample, by all means, try it first. But for me and where I am in whiskey just now, it's an annual treat. If I could get my hands on it and I knew it was going to be like this, I would... I would happily enjoy it. But £95 is a wee bit expensive, yes. The Whiskey Woman is saying the price and age are on a par to the teapot dram. At least the Spring Bank has that age statement. I agree with you fully. Um, and in interestingly, the teapot dram is, is available and easy to get a hold of, despite there only being about 3,000 bottles there about in a batch. Springbank Local Barley, I think they actually put the batches on it. Yeah, this one is 9,700, so nearly 10,000 bottles. And 9,000 on uh, the 10 year olds from the previous year. But these are global releases, and the Teapot Dram isn't. The Teapot Dram is a distillery only release as well. So when I say it's available and easy to get, I'm talking about online from the distillery shop, or you have to actually physically go to the distillery to get it. Um, but yeah, except what you're saying, it's on a par. Um, and it's an exceptional bottling. This isn't core range. This isn't a standard product. It's very much an experimental thing. Um, it's got a decent long finish as well. Enjoying it. Welsh Toro's in. Good to see you, Welsh. She's saying, damn, my Spanish timetable again. Got to go for my supper. <laughs> I'm sipping on some fine old Pulteney 17. Could be a perfect example for the theme tonight, Welsh. The old Pulteney 17. I wonder how many bottles of old Pulteney 17 are hoarded in our collections. Let's have a show of hands. How many people can say that they've got at least one bottle of old Pulteney 17 tucked away because they know it's going to be near impossible to get going forward unless they go to auction or trade it with a collection or something. Fantastic. I do have a quiz tonight. And uh, for a patron-only live stream last week on Thursday night, I shared uh, the first six questions of the patron-only quiz that I did were the six questions that I got wrong in my whiskey exam. Of course, I passed the exam. It was uh, I got a, I was very very happy with my score in the exam. Um, uh, okay, everybody started to admit <laughs> their old Pulteney collection. Nigel's got some. Tony Evans has got one left. Tom, Jean Paul Van der Hoven, Daniel Vermas, Jason Coates, Jillian, <laughs> Graham Stewart. Uh, Chris is saying he's got three old Pulteney seventeen. So there you go. So you know, suddenly we're we're admitting. That it's, there's no shortage of old Pontley 17. It's just not in retail anymore. Are you going to drink all the old Pontley 17 that you have? Or at some point, are you going to release that out in the marketplace again? Scott is saying he's also got old Pontley 17. I have two bottles of old Pontley 17 as well. I've also got an old Pontley 21 as well. All three of those bottles are sealed. Kieran May is saying he's got two. 
Anyway, um, yes, the the quiz I did last week, uh, the first six questions I admitted um, that it was the six questions I got wrong in my exam. And uh, I was curious to see if, if my patrons uh, would do better at the questions. And inevitably, of course, they did than, than I did. I was a wee bit annoyed because I could have just, uh, I could have maybe crept into the top three in the class um, if I just kind of got one or two more questions right. Questions that I actually knew. Annoyingly, some of the questions had actually been in this very show. So I do have a quiz at the end, and there is a wee bit of inspiration taken from that, that whiskey course that I did, and I've taken some of the questions, either directly, almost a copy and paste, or I've taken inspiration from the questions in the quiz at the end tonight. So there will be a quiz if you want to hang around to the end. I do intend to try my very best to keep it under two hours, including the quiz tonight. Let's see how we get on. Uh, our bag, bag is saying, no, only one bottle of Pulteney, and you've tasted it. Ah, that's in 1973. That was fabulous, Andy. Yes, so, you know, we're, we're admitting to it. So, case in point, old Pulteney 17, we have it at home. We loved, loved it, enjoyed drinking it. We hear that it's going to disappear, and we start to hoard. And so we buy it up, and it goes faster from retail outlets, and it just sits at home. But there's still a lot of it around, right? Tony Evans is saying it's for drinking. I would like to think that all whiskey is made for drinking. Um, and I'm part of the problem. If I evangelize about whiskey, and if I am a successful little evangelist, and I manage to convert people to enjoy single malt whiskeys, then I'm part of creating the you know, the fun and the excitement and the enthusiasm around whiskey. And that kind of puts pressure on supply, right? And it does drive prices up. We can't have it all. Uh, Jason Coates has just sent across um, a virtual drama as well. He's saying, my old Pulteney's and I wish Lynn <laughs> a happy birthday and you a great weekend. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much, my friend. Slan to you and your old Pulteney's. Going to put just a tiny spot in of uh, water into. I left my water droppers downstairs tonight, so I'm using the trusty bottle cap method. Don't even have a teaspoon here, so I can't do a Ralphie. Just put a wee spot of water in it, and then we'll compare the two of these. Wow. It's difficult, right? Because you're comparing something that's just been open tonight against something that's been open for a significant amount of months. Um, but this newer one is more malty. Um, that dusty note that I talked about is that's difficult. What, what? How can you? It's a liquid. How can you have a dusty note? But but there is. It's a. There's a. There's a tonight. There's a dusty note to this for me. It's kind of like it's kind of reminiscent of. You know, maybe a dust note that you would get from cereal or or something like that. So this is a maltier thing. Every time I go back to this, I still get that very rich spiced butter thing that I'll absolutely adore. And this is a very, very similar texture, but there's a, there's a more cereal note, as I say. It's a little fresher, a little brighter, a little grassier, a little more prickly, I would say. ABV is almost identical, 57.3, 57.7. I think this is just with it being a new, fresh pour. Still gorgeous whiskey. 
And the type of whiskey that you could play with and play with, just keep adding water by drop by drop by drop until you eventually drown a dram. But at least you've come to understand it, right? You know what it is uh, from start to finish. Eric Waite is saying, Aquavita, I don't think anyone would object to my hoarding whiskey if I put them in my dying will. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Perhaps you know somebody that you can leave it to that li they'll either liquidate it or they'll enjoy it themselves. That would be... You know that it's it's kind of, with it, with it being whiskey, it's not going to go off as such, is it? Stevie A saying, Aquavita, love the crowded barrel magnet. Ah, yes. Let's pull up the camera. So I apologise for my camera tonight, not only is it making me look very, very pink-faced, but the, I've been struggling with focus, I was struggling to set it up tonight. But here we have uh, the Crowded Barrel, so uh, obviously I'm a, I'm a patron of the Whiskey Tribe um, channel, and occasionally they'll just send bizarre things through the mail. I've had a, a little chunk of a, a stave, a, a cask stave, that was branded. Um, that was kind of had a little bit of char on it uh, with the, the logo. Um, and uh, I was sent a chunk of peat from them. They just they literally sent a little chunk of dried peat, um, which was funny. Um, but this uh, uh, crowded barrel magnet, and it was just kind of floating around. And I think it was, this is a, a metal radiator behind me in the wall here. And I think it was stuck to that. And it landed on the floor and at some point somebody has stuck it to the lamp, one of the kids, no doubt. Um, but I spun it round so that instead of it being the, the back that was showing, it was the front. So there you go, my crowded barrel magnet. Greg, I've seen a final opened my Glendronic cast strength, batch one, wow. The only one I have a few days ago and it's absolutely gorgeous. For me, the best of them all I can imagine, Gregor, wow, fantastic whiskey there. And again, that's good. And I kind of like this thing that Jason's done at Malt, that he, he's kind of encouraging people on social media and things. And he's kind of just saying like, you know, let's just kind of open our bottles. And he's stepped up and he said, you know, uh, some of his more valuable bottles or more, uh, He's opened up to celebrate a kind of renaissance in Fife, where he's from. He actually lives in Fife. Hoyt is saying, admit I have a special collection of unopened bottles. Occasionally go in and find surprising things. I guess that's a dynamic that comes, Hoyt, when you've been collecting them for a, some amount of years. I'd still like to think that I know pretty much everything I have, although sometimes I do find... That happens with open bottles as well. I do find something that I've kind of forgotten about and it's nice to remember it again. So yeah, um, it's an interesting topic and I think we could talk about it for, for quite a while. I think that we could eventually get to the point that um, we have to acknowledge that it's not one size fits all. Some people like the reassurance of having those extra bottles there and they fully intend that at least some of them, are, if not all of them, are going to get opened sipped and shared and other people are putting them aside in the hope that well maybe given the fact that their savings or any other investment options aren't attractive to them they might have an opportunity to make a wee bit out of some whiskey then nobody's going to do it on the scale so that they're actually going to change their lives over it um you know certainly as enthusiasts that's very very unlikely right it's just going to be something that could potentially we could either drink or make a wee bit of money on and it seems to be quite a safe option now. I think the point that I want to make um, is that we're aware of it, that we're thinking about it. If anybody goes back to read my uh, blog post of open bottle syndrome from two years ago, if I was to rewrite that post now, it would be a different thing. I still suffer from open bottle syndrome. I've still got far too many bottles open, but you know, the whiskey's not going off. It's not going bad. It's not even going flat really. It's just changing. I've lost very few bottles to having them open for, for too long. I'm quite comfortable with my bottles being open and I, I quite like the idea that people just can help themselves to whatever's there in the cabinets if, if they like. But what I have noticed that's changed is that I have started to become a little bit of a hoarder and I, I kind of just want to bring it up and talk about it and say I am aware of it. Um, we have to kind of try and manage it so that it's not a ball and chain, that it doesn't become an anxiety, that whiskey still remains fun, I think, is my point. That if we 
acknowledge that this is a thing, then we stand a better chance of being able to manage it, I think. Donald Rance has just bought me a virtual drum saying, cheers, Roy, back to work from, from me. I'll catch the replay and quiz when I'm off. I have some green spot Leval Barton. Well, I do if it arrives. Fantastic. Leval Barton is a fantastic green spot as well. Last year, I did a an Irish whiskey themed thing at this time of year because, of course, St. Patrick's Day is very close. Um, but I didn't think I had anything to add. I don't feel that I'm an expert in Irish whiskey at all. I, I, we talked about uh, coffee and what he'd done with his still. We talked about how uh, uh, single pot still Irish exists as a style when it almost shouldn't in the modern era. And I'm very, very gl grateful and glad, glad that it does. But outside of single pot still Irish, I don't have much experience with Irish whiskey. Um, but there'll perhaps be a question or two in the quiz tonight to mark the fact that we're very close to St. Patrick's Day. Uh, but generally, um, I apologise to anybody out there that was expecting uh, Irish themed content from me. But you're going to find a bunch of it around because everybody's kind of doing similar things. There's going to be plenty of Irish whiskey content to keep you all happy if that's what you're interested in. Daniel is saying it's handy to have some stock from something you like, but when the, the PQ was still good, price quality, it doesn't go bad and can always be shared. That's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Jimmy Jazz. Hi, Jimmy. Good to see you and my friend. Fantastic. Let me know if you need an intervention. <laughs> Tom Arison. Good to see you and Tom as well. My name is Tom and I am a hoarder of whiskey bottles. There, I said it and I feel better. You know, I'm going to read a wee bit of uh, Andy's comment that he shared on uh, the Patreon post tonight because it was kind of cool to read. Um, Andy, when I'm talking about Andy, it's our baggie. He's in here tonight. He may still be in. It's quite a long post, and he, and he opens by saying, Roy, this is a good subject to pick, but it has more angles to it than a pentagon. Absolutely, Andy. Um, and he talks about going back 30 years, uh, how he started off in whiskey, and he would buy a few, and then he ended up with a dozen bottles, and then he ends up with 30 bottles. And then on a trip to Isla, somebody had mentioned to him that there's, if he manages to secure a specific bottle, he will be able to recoup his costs of his trip to Isla because it's so limited and it's uh, in such demand. Um, and that kind of changed uh, his perspective on things. Um, but he goes on to say, I don't flip, I never have. I have bottles here I bought 25 years ago. Do I open my bottles? Absolutely. Do I share my whiskey? Definitely. Will I stop collecting? Never. He says, I am guilt, am I guilty? Absolutely not. I love what I do. I've had arguments over the years from the anti-collecting folks, and it's always a good talking point. I could carry on and say a lot more, but I'll wait till later. He says, I did at one point have over 1,400 bottles and three hogsheads, all for the love of whiskey. Do I feel guilty? Never. So there's a guy who's been into whiskey for 30 years more than 30 years. He's seen it all. He's been through where he just had lots of kind of uh, open bottles and a small collection um, to the point where he started to recognize that there was a value in these things and then he started to hoard and then he started to just kind of open and share. And I'm telling you, I know firsthand that he does because at last year's Fife Festival, he did share that 1973 old Pulteney with me. And I know how generous he is and I know how much he loves to share his whiskey. And that to me is a very healthy, uh, sentiment. He's just being honest about what he is and what he enjoys and he uses the words, I love it, I enjoy it. He acknowledges what he's doing and yet he continues because he's enjoying it and I think that's fine. There's an awareness there and he's choosing to do it his way and he's not letting the whiskey or the value of the whiskey or the anxiety of not being able to buy the whiskey or it disappearing. He's not letting any of those things manage him. I was quite struck by that comment. Hope it resonated with some of you too. Good. What else have I got to talk about? Uh, the, the live stream, my next live stream will be two weeks from tonight. There'll be a Thursday night live stream on the 28th. Um, I'll have a, a completely different and fresh theme there. Um, but there is another live stream that's going to come very fast on the back of that. On the 30th, which is a Saturday evening, there will be a special VPUB I would love to share with you what that VPUB is about. 
and what the content is going to be. Um, but I can't, and I shan't, and I won't. Um, if any of you are available on Saturday the 30th, may end up being a wee bit earlier than the usual time. It might be a kind of 9 p.m. thing. Um, but there's going to be, a, and I hope it's kind of going to be a mark of celebration, um, but I don't want to say anything about it just now. And uh, I, yes, there will be a special VPUB on the 30th of March. The regular VPUB will go out on the 28th at its usual time as well. But I just wanted to put that out there. There's 170 plus of you watching just now, so you know. John Paul Vanderhoven is saying, how many bottles in a hogshead? Well, a hogshead, you know, forget about evaporation. You're talking about um, 250 litres. So that should yield what? That should yield 320 bottles there about if it's full. But the normal run rate, you're probably going to get about some something like 225 bottles, depending on the age, from a hoggy. Um, Jean de la Cuisine is saying, that's my parents' 50th wedding anniversary party, so I won't make that probably. Don't worry about it. I appreciate fully also that it's on a Saturday night as well. But it will be available on the replay. And if it works out, I'll be very happy and excited to share it with you on the replay as well. Um, and Jason is saying, I will be flying right past you on the 30th, I'm afraid. Well, perhaps you'll be on an airline that has Wi-Fi. It does exist in the modern era. Uh, multi talk is saying, perhaps a live stream with Ralphie. And he's sticking his tongue out. We all know how reclusive uh, Ralphie can be. Uh, I had a, a really nice time chatting with Ralphie at the Old and Rare this year. Um, it was wonderful to sit and spend a bit of time with him. And it was really cool to appear as a wee cameo. Um, and his uh, extras video as well, uh, he kept that in there, which I thought was quite cool as well. Um, and he, he, can, he keeps getting my name wrong, but, uh, but that's fine. It's not an easy name to remember, is it? Uh, Jay Chong is saying, woohoo, a Saturday live stream means I can actually enjoy a dram with you all. Wow, Jay, so you're joining us tonight in a dram-free scenario. This new spring bank has kind of passed me by a wee bit tonight. I'm very much enjoying it. I think it's a lovely whiskey. I can tell how good it is. But I'm struggling to dig specifics out of it. I think I need to sit and have a wee bit of time with it. Not being very... I think it's just sitting a wee bit tight. The previous one, the 10-year-old, is, is smelling on the nose a bit richer. It's almost like this is kind of warmed up. It's like a warmer thing, and this is this is cold. Now, of course, that's nonsense because they're at the same temperature. But I hope that helps you understand a wee bit more where I'm coming from. Uh, <laughs> Whiskey Radar saying Aquavite. I think Ralphie now knows at least how to pronounce Aquavite. Yes, it's okay. Um, he did say anything. He said it's so... but. Uh, you know, it's just, it's one of these things, if you're, I struggle, you know, to remember things and who I've spoken to and the names of people and all the people I meet. And relative to Ralphie, this is a very small channel. Um, you know, it must be very, very difficult for Ralphie to kind of try and remember names and things. It, it's really funny. If you haven't seen it, just go and, and have a wee look. Uh, there's a, a wee section in the uh, Ralphie extras video. Um, where he bumped into me at the Old and Rare. It was kind of cool. Um, Alistair Gray saying, thanks for the coin, Roy, and kind message. You're very welcome, Alistair. I'll raise this uh, glass of Springbank local barley and say slant you, and thank you for your virtual dram, and thank you for the support in buying the coin as well. If you do go to the website to read the post that I did about op open bottle syndrome a couple of years ago, uh, you'll also be able to... Um, uh, read a post I did more recently. It's the first post I did in about two years on the website. I apologize. Um, when I did a kind of people asking about the coins all the time. Uh, the coins are still here. If you've bought a coin previously, I'm still holding them for you. I can't hold them forever. If you're not interested in buying the coins, again, uh, no problem. There's no, it's purely optional. These are always optional things. But let me know and free them up for some other people because there's lots of people asking for specific numbers. And of course, I'm having to turn them away if there's a coin is on reserve for you. Um, 
uh, but the, your coins are still going to be here and I'm going to hold them at least for another couple of weeks anyway, at least until the end of March um, before I start freeing them up. If you're interested in getting a new number, a fresh coin uh, with your own number on it, whatever, you just need to send an email to whiskey at aquavitae.com and I'll try and sort you out with the number that you're after. Um, just let me know how many coins you need, if you've got any number preferences, and I'll let you know how to get your hands on a coin. What I would like to share with you, and I'm, I'm hoping I should have had this ready, but I don't have it ready. I don't think I'm telling tales out of school by, uh, let's see, by sharing this with you. I don't think this has been widely released yet, but... Look at this coin. Can anybody tell me whose coin that is? It's very cool. Of course, it's Vin and No Nonsense Whiskey. And this coin, um, this is this is my number. He gave me my number uh, of uh, this coin, and uh, it's the same exact same size, weight, style, same manufacturer as uh, Scotch Test Dummies, Scotch Four Dummies, Trini and C. Uh, the Aquavitae coins. Um, these are, it's, this, it's the same style of coins. So if you're a collector, there's a new coin in town. And I think it's very striking and I think it's quite cool. And there's a little Easter egg in Latin written on the side as well. Good stuff, Vin. And I hope that more channels join as well. I know there's going to be kind of um, too many coins and maybe we're not all going to collect coins, but I think it's nice. And if, if you follow a channel, you enjoy a channel, you buy a uh, the coin of that specific channel or whatever. And it's kind of nice. And if you do end up using these as challenge coins, so if you meet someone and you say, are you carrying the coin? And if they're not carrying the coin, they buy you a drink. And if they are carrying you the coin, use the challenger then has to buy the drink. If you do get involved in that, I'm going to suggest it doesn't matter which channel's coin you're carrying. As long as it's kind of like a, a whiskey tube coin, you're covered. You've met the challenge. So let's look at time. I'm now getting on for 11 o'clock, so I'm going to skip into the quiz in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, John De De La Cuisine is saying, I received my coin a couple of days ago. Thanks again for that. I hope you love it, John. Thank you very, very much for your support. Nigelson is saying, just finished prepping tomorrow's dinner and finally sitting down to a dram, opening a bottle in the spirit of the show. Fantastic, Nigel. I hope you're enjoying it as well. Uh, Aquavite, please check your DM on T. Okay, uh, I, if we if we were having any trouble there, uh, Greg, uh, and uh, if we're having any trouble tonight, Greg, uh, Whiskey Rev will take care of it. Don't worry about it. Okay, so Steve A saying agreed. Aquavite, any whiskey tube coin should count, of course. We can't all walk around with a pocket full of coins if we have them. Um, ah, Toby is saying, Aquavita, Vin's coins aren't on general sale until next week. Patrons only right now. Ah, I think I checked with Vin. I think I checked with him. And I think he said it was okay. Don't tell him. I'll be fine. Um, and Steve A is saying, Aquavita, the whiskey rev is gone. No problem. Uh, Jason Whiskey Wise is on his way back from a Berry Brothers and Rudd tasting. He said he's hopefully going to join a wee bit later. Might have to do the quiz without Jason tonight as well, which will probably be the first time that's ever happened. Um, uh, Whiskey Jason is saying the coins from Aquavita are just awesome. I'm glad you like them, Jason. And I think, Jason... When are you coming? You're heading over to Scotland. Is it next week or the week after? I'm hoping to get a chance to hook up with you at Deanston. Um, be nice to finally meet you. I know that I, met, I missed you in Frankfurt. I saw you in Frankfurt and I kind of stood back and I waited while you were interviewing somebody behind their booth and I waited and kind of watched what you were doing and things and you had your little uh, your LED lamp and things there. You were filming an interview in German and I just waited uh, and then I decided that I'd leave you in peace to do your work and come back and meet you later. But I ended up missing you, didn't I? Alistair Gray is saying, Aquavite, ever thought about getting Aquavite branded Glencairn glasses? Yes, Alistair. 
but I won't say any 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 more about that just now because it's tied in with another project that I'm doing and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I'll let you know a bit more about that in, in upcoming streams. But there's uh, something afoot. Gregor is saying, Aquavite, you two are tied with coin snafus, Roy. Don't know what you mean, Gregor. Coin snafus. Jimmy Leg is saying, love the quiz. Graham Stewart is saying, what numbers are you up to now? Um, I, I have, I bought 500 coins this time. I've probably got uh, more than 100 left, less than 200, I guess. Um, the last last time I didn't buy enough, I was encouraged, the Scotch Test Dummies were the guys who started this, and I asked Scott for some advice, and Scott from Scotch Test Dummies said, yeah, 250 is fine, but I think you find it's not going to be enough, and I couldn't imagine who selling 250 coins, and I bought 250, it was too conservative, and I got them in August, and by the end of September, they were all they were all gone. And since then, I've had uh, people asking me for coins, and I've just kind of had them on a waiting list. Now the waiting list has, has been satisfied; they've, they've got their coins now. Um, patrons have all got their coins, um, and there's just a few on reserve now for people that bought previous numbers. So there should be enough to keep me going for a few months into the future. I hope. Um, it's really nice. It's nice that people are having fun with them. It's nice that people enjoy that kind of coin culture thing. Read the blog post that I did. It kind of talks a wee bit more about it, what I think it means to people. Um, but somebody commented and, and made a really nice comment. I wish I could remember who it was because it was kind of cool. And they summed it up quite nicely that it's a very real world tactile manifestation of this virtual whiskey community that we all enjoy. That's kind of what these coins represent. And it's kind of nice when you do use them as a fidget or a flipper or a coin, a glass topper or whatever. It's kind of nice when people say, well, what is this coin? What is it all about? And you get a chance to talk about uh, the growing and pretty awesome whiskey community that we all have here. Um, a quick shout out tonight, Scotch for Dummies, of course, are going live after me. It's usually about uh, 3 a.m. in the morning, but I've kind of worked out that I think the daylight saving has kicked in in the States already am I right or wrong on that so it could be that it's uh that, that I'm an hour out with my timings tonight in general um but there may be other live streams as well I usually check in advance but forgot to check to see if there, anybody else was live tonight perhaps Jason from the mash and drum uh, and uh, other channels may be going live as well yeah whiskey Jason is over from the 26th to 31st of March looking forward to meeting you Jason um Christina saying I'd buy the crap out of Aquavite Glencairn glasses. Well, I'll, let, I'll give you a little hint as well because um, this is a, wife, a Fife Whiskey Festival glass. I've just noticed I picked that one tonight. Fantastic. The Aquavite, the whole uh, concept of the channel is about sharing and it's whiskey to, to share, right? So uh, Glencairn do a twin pack um, and there'll be two glasses that match. Um, both in the Aquavite theme, uh, both kind of a take on the you know the culture, the spirit of community, and things like that in the channel. But they'll come in a set of two, um, and I know that some of you get frustrated with that and say, "Oh, I just I just want to buy one." Um, but, but you know, it's kind of about sharing. I appreciate that I'm probably going to sell less because I'm kind of forcing people to buy two. Um, but it, it's just I can't miss the opportunity of kind of it's not whiskey until it's shared, um, and not kind of put a sharing pack of Glencairns together. That's the idea anyway. I'll share more with you near the time and let you understand what it's about. Steve A saying, I suspect Whiskey in the Six will be live tonight too. Ah, he was going to do a live. He was. Um, Christina Zappoli is saying, yes, daylight saving time kicked off last week. It's 7.03 p.m. here. Daylight saving is at the end of March for us. So I may be an hour out with my timings. Um, and Gregor saying how we missed that sound before Roy okay it's three minutes past midnight in Germany uh, let's get the quiz underway then Malcolm Douglas is saying he sent a PayPal request for a coin when did you send it Malcolm and would it be under Malcolm Douglas uh, it's not a name I recognise um, yeah, let, let me know offline 
whiskey at aquavitae.com. Um, I hope you've not sent it to the wrong. It's a paypal.me forward slash aquavitae is my PayPal. Um, unless it has just been recently, if it's just tonight or something like that, uh, I will probably pick it up. And if, if anybody is still waiting on their coins, I'm up to date with all of my shipments. Everything is gone. I've been really good. I've kind of got a flow in place now and things like that to get them out as quickly as possible. If you're still waiting on your coins, uh, some places like Canada is difficult. It seems like Norway is bizarrely difficult as well. Um, but if you are waiting on your coins, let me know because that's me coming up on three weeks now of shipping coins. I should be pretty much up to date. Okay, in the spirit of me not having anyone to... Uh, Christina, I wonder if you are going to stay. I've just noticed your, your uh, face is the first one I noticed there. I know you're an admin for the tribe. Maybe you might want to try and manage the quiz just by putting in a definition between uh, questions just to ready the troops each time. We can probably get through it without any admin, actually. Let's see if I can make it work. You should be able to see the quiz screen. Let's get right into it. And I think we might actually get under the two hours tonight. I always feel like I'm missing lots of things, but let's go with it. Uh, Whiskey Jason's offering should, is help with the quiz. Absolutely, anybody wants to help, you can just put in some dotted lines, say question one, um, and it just helps me. When I, when I look up, I can see uh, the definition and things as well. And it also helps me with the lag. There is a lag between what I'm saying and what you guys are putting in the chat. And it kind of just helps me steady things a little bit. So let's go underway with the quiz. I think this is a moderately difficult quiz tonight, if I'm honest. Some of the questions, there's a couple of easy ones in there. Some of the questions are inspired by the whiskey exam I took uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, some of them are uh, just topical things. And uh, let's see how you go on. But everybody, good luck. Here is uh, the quiz at the end tonight. Question one. You might recognize this. By volume, the largest Scotch whiskey export market is A, the USA, B, India, or C, France. And I'm talking about by volume, not by value. Specifically, which country drinks the most by volume? Graham Young, you star, has just bought me a virtual drama and said, quiz, love them, but I tend to suck at these. <laughs> Happy birthday, Lynn. I need to let my wife see how many people are wishing her a happy birthday. It's wonderful. Graham, thank you so much. I hope that we have another chance to shake hands again in Glasgow or wherever later this year. Slanchy, my friend. Oh, it's quite all over the place here. By volume, is it A, USA, B, India, or C, France? Let's see what you guys think. Okay, a few people say B. Michael Johnson, good to see you in, Michael. Uh, John uh, Baseman is in as well. Uh, he's also saying B, Isabel, Simon Ray, Nicholas Burt, and John Pallister. Good to see you guys in as well. Um, everybody uh, else seems to be favouring C, it would look like. Let me tell you that the biggest market for Scotch whiskey in volume is France. They love the stuff. They just can't get enough of it. Most of it is blends, of course, but that's been true for a long time now. France buy a lot of Scotch whiskey. Um, we sell more Scotch whiskey to France. In fact, they drink more uh, Scotch whiskey in France in one month than they do cognac and Armagnac in a year, I'm told. I've not seen figures to that effect, but that's what I've been told anecdotally. So thank you, France. Question two. Kind of topical. And yes, coffee invented the continuous still we know today, but who was first? He's the guy that, that took the kind of inefficient batch process of pot still distillation from malt whiskey. He brought along this continuous coffee still, which is just a machine that runs very high efficiently, produces a whiskey from any grain, um, and he is the guy that brought along the efficient design that we still use today. But somebody beat him to it. It just wasn't very efficient. Who was that? Was it A. Mackie Co., B. Robert Steen, 
C. William Haig. Was it A. Mackey, B. Steen, or C. Haig? Jimmy Legg is saying, I know this. Eric Waite is saying, answer two, Robert Steen. Hmm. Looks like Eric has led the crowd. Looks like most people. Multiagus Muncher is, is in. Good to see you. Fantastic, Matthew. Um, he's saying B. He seems to think it's Robert Steen as well. So let's have a look. Who was the first guy to come up with the idea of a continuous still? It was, of course, B. Robert Steen. He had the idea first, and AS Coffee um, developed it, made a far more efficient um, version, and uh, famously, and they talked about this on the Whiskey Tribe video. Have a look at the Whiskey Tribe video. It was really cool today. They did a, a single grain whiskey, a Port Dundas, um, and when they, they, they reviewed the Port Dundas 12-year-old and they compared it to the 18-year-old, they dipped into that whole concept about how an AS Coffee being an Irishman went along to the Irish distillers and said, I've got a still, it's much more efficient. And they uh, kind of, well, there was the idea that it was, they wanted to stick with the traditional pot stills, but they also saw coffee as a competitor at that time because he was involved in a Dublin distillery. So they didn't want, they didn't want to deal with a guy who they saw as a competitor. And that obviously prompted coffee uh, to bring his uh, invention to Scotland and the Scottish distillers uh, adopted it and embraced it, embraced it wholeheartedly. That then led Andrew Usher to start uh, blending, and uh, you know the rest is history. Um, so there you go. It was Steen. Question three: In whiskey production, the piece is what? The piece. When they talk about the piece, what are they talking about? Is it a the green barley layer? in the malt house, B, the stirring rod in a louter mash tun, and C, a sample from the spirit safe. So when they talk about the piece, what are they talking about? This was in my whiskey exam. Uh, I got this one right. It was one of the ones I got right. I'm not sharing any of the ones I got wrong with you. I did that with my patrons last week. So they, they got to know all the questions I got wrong. It was great fun. I loved that course. I would do it again. I would do the exact same course again. Just go back and do a wonderful course. I don't know what I'm going to do on a Monday night now going forward. Dr. Matt Bishop. Good to welcome you in, Matt. He is saying safe. C. Lots of people saying C. Some people thinking B. Um, wow. This is foxing you. I think you're confused. You don't know Whiskey Jason is saying B. DJ11, good to welcome you in. DJ is saying C. Uh, Service Alafis, good to welcome you in, my friend. He's saying C, but he's guessing. And Cosmo Coast Whiskey Reviews is saying C as well. DH Self, good to see you, my friend, is saying gut was B. Let's have a look. The piece. The piece is, in fact, the green barley layer in the malt house. So I wonder how many... Have you answered A? Let's scroll up and down, up and down, up and down. Wow, that's a banana skin. Anthony Dunn is saying, who ran your course? It was John Lamond. He's been in the whiskey industry for uh, since the 70s. Uh, lots and lots of knowledge. Eric, what did you answer? <laughs> the rug that covers the bald man's head. I don't think anybody, did anybody get this right? So what they do is when they bring in uh, uh, the barley after it's been steeped, the, the wet barley, and uh, they kind of lay it out on the, the malt house floor on the uh, on the on the floor, and it's usually about I think it's about nine inches or so that kind of depth. Um, and to avoid the buildup of heat as it starts to germinate, they have to keep turning it and turning it and turning it. But what, what they talk about is they turn the piece that's that's called that mat, that heavy mat of barley, if you like, is called the piece. Wow. A bit of a banana skin there. Wasn't intended to be. But there you go, we learned something. Question four. 
which distillery preceded Ailsa Bay inside William Grant's Girvan plant. So Girvan is a huge uh, distillery down on the west coast, the southwest coast of Scotland, producing uh, lots and lots of uh, whiskey for grants, um, using uh, continuous coffee stills. But inside there, they have a pot stills, uh, a large malt distillery, and they're called Ailsa Bay. But in the past, they had a similar thing on a much smaller scale. And it was only open for a few years. This distillery was only open for about nine years. Which distillery was it? Was it A, Malt Mill? Was it B, Ladyburn? Or was it C, Little Mill? A, Malt Mill. B, Ladyburn. Or C, Little Mill. There was a malt distillery inside. Uh, so the Girvan complex opened in the mid-60s, I think about 63. A few years after it, they opened this distillery and they were producing malt whiskey at it for a while. And uh, But it closed down in the mid-70s. It was only open nine years. It should be a wee bit easier, I think. Let's see what you're saying. Jimmy Lang is admitting he doesn't have a clue. Ander Garcia, good to see you in, Ander. That looks like a new name. Um, He's saying C, Kelton Moose is saying B, Ebhead also B, Malt Mariners is saying B. A lot of you seem to think that it's Ladyburn, some of you guessing that it's a Little Mill. Christina is saying Ladyburn. Krista Whiskey Bowman is saying uh, B, Ladyburn. Tony Evans is also saying Paul Gibbs B. Great to see so many of you. And I, I just, it's wonderful how many of you have actually had the pleasure of meeting too. Quite amazing. Let's have a wee look to see what the predecessor to Ilsa Bay was. It was, in fact, B. Ladyburn. Only open for nine years. Um, one of the rarer whiskies to try and get your hands on, right, if you find that as a malt. Okay, I'm going to show you an image now. I just want you to tell me which distillery are we looking at. Um, if you know, don't jump in and tell us. I'm going to give you the options first. Is it... A, Old Bushmills, B, Tillamore Dew, or C, Middleton. I'm going to leave the picture up there so you can study it. Obviously an Irish distillery here. But is it Bushmills, Tillamore Dew, or Middleton? What do we think? I'll go back to the previous picture to let you see it a bit clearer. Jimmy Legg is asking if it's a weird angle. Yeah, I suppose it is. It's certainly zoomed in a bit. Um, yeah. But it's a genuine image. It's, uh, I haven't doctored it or anything. All I did was kind of remove any uh, painted names. Okay. So to give you your options again, A, Bushmills, B, Tillamore Dew, C, Middleton. People are guessing generally here. So there's one answer that I was looking for, and he has answered, and he's answered the right question, but I'm not going to tell you who it is, but it's the guy who I ex would expect to get it right. Stefan G is in. Uh, so that picture is on my Bushmills. So a, let's have a look. It is, in fact, Bushmills. And the guy I was looking for was Phil at Causeway Coast, Coast Whiskies. And he lives very, very close, and he knows Bushmills intimately. And he answered correctly, it is, of course, old Bushmills A. Okay, question uh, six. Is this question six? Six. The Scotch Whiskey Association was established in... Now, just to, be, just to clarify, Scotch Whiskey Association is the body that's put in place uh, to kind of manage and uh, legislate and uh, uh, take care of the interests of Scotch whiskey productions. Um, I'm sure that that's not how they would term it, but that's roughly what they do. But what year were they founded? Was it A, 1823, B, 1912, or C, 1988? This question was in my exam. There's a span of 150 years there. So I'm curious to see how you guys got on with this one. But the Scotch Whiskey Association have been around for quite a while, as you can see. The most recent date there is 1988. Was it 1823, A, 1912, B, 
or C, 1988? What do we think? Lots of people, again, there's lots of guesswork going on here and things like that. And I don't think it's one of those questions that, you know, I don't think we learn too much from this, right? It's not that interesting a question. The reason it's in here is because I was sharing some of the questions from my exam paper that we sat. And it was a multiple choice as well. It was kind of fun. Chris Banks Wildlife is in. Good to see you, Chris. He's guessing B for 1912. Malt Mar Mariner is also guessing B. And Eric Waite is saying he thought it was 1942. Stevie is saying uh, he went for C, but I see a very different answer on Google Aqua VT. Oh dear, the Google thing. Okay, what we'll do quickly is uh, we will share that it was 1912. Scotch Whiskey Association was founded in 1912. I hope, Steve, that that's the answer that you found on Google. Um, uh, Remaster is saying he's a little late. Did Roy open the springy? Of course. There's no way the channel is founded on the concept of opening whiskey. So, well, I, I will admit to slipping closer to the hoarder type habits. Um, and my collection has grown more as a kind of a sealed collection. And I'm, I just need to acknowledge that I'm aware of it. But I still fully intend to share open and share as many bottles as I possibly can. And yes, the nine-year-old uh, Springbank local barley has been open tonight. I have to admit, to compare to the 10-year-old, it's still sitting a little bit tight for me. It's not fair to judge it, but I can already tell it's going to be a fabulous whiskey and it's just going to keep giving. I fully predict it'll keep giving as we go forward. Let's go on to question seven. A uh, tricky one again, I think. Uh, this was in the exam. At what temperature typically is distiller's yeast killed off? So this is during fermentation. Um, and I think I go on to see that in the, the options. It's during fermentation. Uh, they have to be very, very careful to keep the temperature below this because it just literally kills off the yeast. Is it A, 29.5 degrees centigrade, B, 35 degrees, or C, 40 degrees? At what temperature during fermentation is the yeast killed off? 29 and a half, 35 or 40. <laughs> wow. It's quite an interesting one tonight. Um, I like to throw a production question in there from time to time as well. I remember my first few whiskey distillery tours were uh, kind of quite perfunctory things. I was just kind of touring and going through the motions in order to get to the drams at the end. Um, and then something happened during my whiskey journey that I really started to get really interested. When I really understood the differences in flavour, I wanted to understand what our distillery is doing in order to get that flavour in the whiskey. Because obviously just being from in the case of malt whiskey, just barley, water and yeast. I mean, how can we have this infinite flavour spectrum, right, from just those ingredients? So I started to pay much, much more attention. And of course, we discover um, if anybody answered B for 35 degrees, that's the answer I was looking for tonight. Let's see who answered B. Yeast dies at 35 degrees. Most of you seem to know that. Fantastic and impressive. Um, <laughs> Christina saying damn centigrade. <laughs> Sorry, it's metric. Christina, I apologize. I don't know what the Fahrenheit equivalent is. I really don't. I don't understand um, uh, Imperial at all. Malt Maliners, Kilted Moose, Graham Young, Malcolm Douglas, John Pallister, JW Baseman, uh, Marku Mackinnon, Sid Martin, good to see you, and Sid. Anthony Dunn, Michael Johnson, so many of you said B, 35 degrees, and you're absolutely right. Let's move on now to question eight and ask another kind of pseudo production question that I found really interesting. Kiln dried oak is often cited to A, increase astringent wood flavour, B, decrease evaporation, or C, make for easier coopering. This isn't. This is something that I hadn't really considered that much, but uh, I know that distillers um, tend to insist on air dried oak being used for the staves in order to make the barrels. I knew that that was the case, but I didn't understand exactly 
why? Why were they? Why did they prefer natural, slower process of air drying the wood than the faster kind of kiln, kiln dried process? So was it a to in, is it believed that it increases the astringent wood flavors kiln dried oak, or is it b that it decreases evaporation, or is it c it makes for easier coopering? What do we think? Let's see what you think. Steve is saying that 35 degrees is 95 degrees Fahrenheit. There you go. Um, everybody, oh no, some, some people think, I think the popular answer here is that uh, kiln dried adds astringent wood flavours to the whiskey. Ah. Cited, Eric, I mean, it's often said to. It's often said to either increase astringent wood flavour, decrease evaporation, or make for easier coopering. Hey, Josh Manley's in. Hi, Josh, good to see you. Said thanks for coin 331. Welcome in, 331. It's good to have you here, and I hope you like the coin, Josh. Thanks for your support, and thanks for ordering one. Uh, Eric Way is saying, we use cited to mean quote, I think you mean used for. No problem. Kiln dried oak is often used for. No, it's not used for. This is uh, either an incidental thing or a benefit from it. So I apologize for my use of the word cited, um, but it is said to, let's say it is said to. Let's share it with you. Kiln dried as opposed to air, air dried oak is said to increase astringent wood flavour. So it's a negative thing, which is why distillers insist on air dried staves. That's why I gave you a bit of a clue there. So hopefully you got that right. Question nine, which of the following is not an Irish distillery? I'll give you three distilleries here and I just want you to tell me which one is not Irish. A, Blackwater, B, Powers Court, or C, Donald's Mill. Now, there's a plethora of new Irish distilleries and there's a huge renaissance in Irish whiskey and Irish distilling. It's fantastic to see. Um, and one of these is not part of that. A, Blackwater, B, Powers Court, or C, Donald's Mill. What do we think? I'm interested to see what you think of this. The Splendiferous Dram has got six out of eight. Great score. Dram session, the same. Fantastic. Marcus has got five, Moses four out of eight, 50 50 so far. Moses, good to see you in, my friend. Uh, Graham Young has decided that it's B for Powers Court. It was Whiskey Jason and Kilted Moose both saying C. John Pallister agrees C, Sid Martin C, Christina Zerpoli C. Lots and lots of people saying C. Chris Whiskey Bowman is also saying C. Uh, Yen, Yen's Roger. Christofferson, I know that it's Jens now. Good to have you in, my friend. Christofferson is saying A for Blackwater. The Donner Pass Whiskey is in. Good to see you, my friend. He's saying, hi, working. We're working now, but washing it off and on. Glen Going 21 just arrived an hour ago. Hour ago. Can't wait to get off work to try it. So there you go. Donner Pass, you're going to pop that and sip it as soon as you possibly can. Fantastic. Um, and let's share with you the non-Irish distillery here is, of course, C, Donald's Mill is not an Irish distillery. It is, in fact, a figment of Aquavitae's imagination. I apologise. The answer I was looking for for C, if you gave yourself C. Now, before we go into question 10, let's see who's sitting. Well, there was quite a few decent scores tonight. I noticed Chris Banks Wildlife is on 7 out of 8. How did you go on with that last one? How did you go on with question 9, Chris? Um, Eric Waite is saying, odd, I've only heard the word cite to either mean quote, reference, or to uh, issue a ticket for a violation. Okay, don't worry, Eric, chill out. A fellow Cosby, of course, whiskey is a five out of nine, Splendiferous Dram, seven out of nine. Stephen G is saying seven out of nine. Chris Bank Wildlife, what a great score, eight out of nine, fantastic. Anybody beaten eight out of nine? Looking for a nine out of nine, anybody got it? Nicholas Burt, yay, seven out of nine, fantastic. <laughs> Christina Zapoli said, I lost count keeping track of what questions we were on. I think I'm on five out of 10. So you're at five out of nine, Christina. So if you get the last one right, 
you're on for a clear pass mark. In fact, you've got five already, so you should be uh, it should be a pass mark already. Um, Eric, what saying, lol? <laughs> Let's go to question 10. See if anybody is, uh, is going to manage a 9 out of 10 tonight. Question 10. Parkmore Distillery, now silent, is located in A. Dufton, B. Rothis, or C. Keith. Which town, obviously in Speyside, is Parkmore Distillery? Of course, it's closed. It's a lost distillery, Parkmore. But I want to know in which town was it? A. Dufton, B. Rothis, or C. Keith? Graham Young is saying that he's shite at this. Don't worry, Graham. Don't worry. We try our wee best. And I think that, as I said earlier, I think it's moderate to difficult tonight. I'm quite impressed at some of these scores that are coming in. Uh, Gregor is saying it's a hard one tonight. Might be a wee bit harder. Uh, Marcus uh, on six out of nine. Was Guerrero four out of nine? <laughs> I don't think J Jason Whiskey Wise has uh, appeared yet, has he? He's having a nice night uh, being hosted by Berry Brothers. Uh, a tasting. Okay, let's look at question 10. And you can tell me how you guys are getting on. Parkmore Distillery, now lost, was in Dufton. So it would be alongside the Bilveni, Glenfiddich, Mortlack, so many other distilleries in that uh, tiny wee town which calls itself uh, the world's whiskey capital. It was in Dufton. So there you go. If you answered A for Dufton, give yourself a point and let me know how you scored tonight. I'm going to wrap up tonight as there's 117 of you still in. Wait until it's quieter till I share this with you because it's really, really exciting. You stayed till the end so you get heads up on what's happening here. But I ask you, and it's nothing is absolutely permanent or confirmed yet, but if you are um, in a position to get anywhere near Glasgow on the 18th of May, it's a Saturday, we are hoping, and I know that I've had pressure from a, from a lot of you for a long time to arrange an event, some kind of social, real-world event where we can take the community and actually shake hands and share drams and meet up all of you fine uh, guys and girls and just have a proper real-world whiskey experience. Um, well, the Scottish Test Dummies are coming over to Scotland in May and they're uh, just waiting on the final uh, T's to be crossed and I's to be dotted. But it looks like that we are uh, shaping up for an 18th of May get together. Now, there will be a kind of structured thing. Um, there will be a ticketed thing, and that will be obviously limited numbers. But don't worry about that. If you can't get involved in a tasting, whatever we arrange, um, you there will be a much more open thing. We'll find a venue, a whiskey bar in Glasgow, somewhere that's got the space for us all to kind of meet up and shake hands and say hello and meet each other. Um, that's the 18th of May. Aquavite, Scotch Test Dummies, Glasgow, Whiskey, could be amazing. Um, Daniel is saying it would have been nice to be there if I'd known that earlier. Unfortunately, I'm actually telling you too early just now because nothing has, the flights have not been absolutely uh, booked yet. But there's been some uh, tentative uh, things booked and put into place. Um, and I'm hoping that that is the date that we're going to be able to do something together. 8th of May is a day off in France. It's the 18th, Saturday, the 18th of May, Gregor. Kilted Moose is saying, I'm there, my friend. I have bottles to bring. <laughs> Uh, Cosmic Phil is saying, damn, I'll be going on holiday. May sell a kidney <laughs> to get there, though. I know it's it's one of these things that um, not everybody's going to be able to make it. It's going to be frustrating, I know, for a lot of people. But the alternative is that we just don't do it, right? And it never, ever happens. I think if we do it, if we have an event and we get people together, we'll get ourselves in a situation that, that it really makes us realize that it can work and it's a fun thing to do. And it'll prompt us to do more things. Our baggy said he's been to Parkmore. Murray McDavid owned the old distillery manager's house. That's right. Um, 
Jens is saying, too bad I've booked a Scotland tour. I'm going home the 18th in the morning. Ah. That's the frustration it's going to be. There's nothing I can do. There's no way I can uh, make it happen any faster. There's no way I can... Um, George is saying, great stream right here. Everyone need to run Aqua V to tell Lynn, thanks for sharing you on her birthday. She'll be very, very grateful for that, George. Thanks for your support. Thanks to Amy. And uh, thanks for your kind words again. Whiskey Bowman is saying, Aqua I hope our baggie is coming. <laughs> Hopefully, Chris, uh, you'll get to meet Andy. That would be amazing. I'd be surprised uh, if he couldn't make it, actually. No pressure, Andy. Tom Harris saying that is right around my birthday. Have a drink for me. We will do, Tom. And I think what we'd like to do is try and kind of share it with the people that can't get there as well. Um, so try and do uh, as much live streaming and, as, and record as much footage as we possibly can as well. Angela saying, damn, I'm in Scotland the weekend after. Maybe have to make it up twice <laughs> in two weeks. Um, I know. I know. Even though it's kind of two months away, it's still fairly short notice, but it's just the way it's worked out. I have an invite from Waterford Distillery, um, and I'm really excited to take them up on that. And I, I you know, I'm really okay with taking this invite. And uh, Ardnaho as well has given me an invite to go over and see uh, the opening of their distillery as well, and they're offering to pay my accommodation. Um, and perhaps it looks like maybe they'll pay transport as well. Waterford, that is certainly a given. Um, and I think it's interesting to do that because while I don't want to take free stuff and I don't want to be paid for or sponsored or take any money from brands, I want the access, I want the information, I want the insight, I want to see what's happening and I want to be able to share that information with you. And in order for me to get that access, I need to be willing to collaborate with brands. Um, and as long as there is not, no onus on me to say positive things, um, or in, they're not trying to manage or control my uh, views, opinions, free speech or anything afterwards. If they're just really wanting to share what they're doing in a collaborative spirit, then I, it, when it's difficult for me to finance it myself, trips and ferries and flights and accommodation and things, then absolutely I'm more than open to that. I hope you feel comfortable with that too. I fully, fully accept that I am funded by the community. Kelton Newsom saying, thank you for the stream, Aqua V team. Great to see you all tonight. Happy dramming this weekend, everyone. I'm so glad that you're feeling a bit better, Scott, as well. Service of is saying, sounds fun. Um, and Cosmic Coast Whiskey's reviews is saying, do Waterford. It's brilliant. I'm really quite excited to do it. But rather than the dummies landing in there, the guys from Texas, the Whiskey Tribe are coming over as well, and me going in and us all being there at the same time, I think it does, it serves the the kind of creative content that we want to make around distillery trips like that better if we do it individually and we all have a different take on it. And I think it gives the distillery and what they're doing, um, uh, you know, more exposure as well. It's not kind of a YouTuber convention then. It's, it, it's, it's about Waterford and it's about the cool things that they're doing with barley and terrar and provenance and all of these things that they, that they like to talk about. And then hopefully we get a chance to share with you what they're doing as well. Christina saying, I want to try, I want to try to talk the finance into a trip across the pond in June, July after my semester ends, but May might be a hard time to get there. So sad. Christina, don't worry about it. Um, when you come to Scotland, there is so much here that you're not going to feel let down, regardless of when it is. Ask anybody in the chat that's made the trip uh, the same way that you hope to. Um, you're not going to feel let down. Graham Young is saying, uh, hey Roy, I believe we all appreciate what you bring to the table. Thanks, Graham. So industry is more than welcome to help the evangelism. That's right, as long as they don't um, in some way impede it, right? Bah, stupid work getting in the way of V-pubbing, says Jay. Jay, I just appreciate you being here. And listen, if there's things that you've missed, you can pick it up on the replay. Is there anything that I've forgotten? I'm just looking at my list here. There's a bunch of stuff. But it always, there's nothing here that's so important that it can't wait till the next time, right? Um, so thanks to Jason for the inspiration. Thanks to him for sharing that wonderful inaugural Daft Mill with us. 
uh, I can say quite honestly that the absolute highlight of the Fife Whiskey Festival was Daft Mill, and there was a fantastic batch one Ben Nevis 10 year old cast strength. It's limited edition, there's not a lot of it, but it's wonderful stuff. If you see that out there, don't hesitate to drop the money on it. Although I appreciate it, it sounds like it will be a bit expensive as well. It's kind of at the same money as the as the Springbank local barleys and uh, uh, teapot drams and that, but it's it's kind of a limited thing. Uh, ben Nevis 10 year old cast strength, it was a uh, Quite a delicious dram. But this highlight of the show was Daft Mill. Very elegant, tasty whiskey. Every time I go back, I love it more. It's just a shame it's so bloody difficult to get a hold of. Steve is saying, great VPUB tonight. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, love the hour off say on DST, so I get some real time to enjoy rather than almost entirely at work driving home. Jimmy Legg is saying, Nova Scotia is calling you for a visit. Absolutely, we could go and see Glen Breton, couldn't I? Or Glenora, where Glen Breton is made. And Baggy saying, Daft Mill is incredible. The bottles he had under the counter. Oh my, yeah, he had a sherry cask under there as well. Um, but to be honest with you, just the, the winter release that I bought and I've enjoyed, there's only this much left in it, just sensational. Just so delicate and subtle and quiet and complex and rich and uh, seductive and uh, just a nice, clean style of Scotch whiskey. Whiskey Bowman saying, thanks for the stream, Roy and Mrs. Roy. <laughs> Enjoy the last 15 minutes of your birthday. <laughs> yes. Um, I could review the cheers all. Catch you at the next one. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for joining again. Uh, ONG is saying, hi, Roy. Sorry I'm late. You're just catching the dying ember zone, but fortunately, uh, it's here on the replay for you. Thanks for joining, and I uh, hope you do get a chance to pick it up in the replay. Stu Baby is in saying, Aqua Vida, good evening. Any tips? The best way for me to visit and enjoy Isla like you did. Are there any tour companies you'd recommend? Maybe Scottish Roots is one to look up. And if you're interested, Eric Waite might be able to help you with some tips on that as well. I pointed him in the direction of Scottish Roots and he seemed to be very happy with them. They do a good job. Scottish Roots. Phil is saying, I've a great show tonight as always. Cheers for the crack. Thanks, Phil. Pleasure to have met you a couple of weeks ago as well. Jay Chung is saying, thank you for the excellent people as always. Happy birthday to your lovely bride, <laughs> who's a whiskey saint for sharing you with we whiskey folk. She's very, very generous. Listen, guys, I have the last wee bit of my Springbank local barley. Delicious dram. There's things over my shoulder that I was going to share with you tonight, uh, but uh, they'll keep till the VPUB on the 28th of the month. And then remember, pencil in your diary if you're available. There will be a special VPUB on Saturday the 30th of the month as well. If I can pull that off, I promise it won't let you down. I love you all. Thanks all for your time. It's fantastic to hang out with you here. Um, hopefully and maybe we'll get a chance to do some kind of real world thing. Uh, keep your eyes on social media feeds. Um, uh, and uh, yes, I'll share more with you as it becomes available. I've kept it under two hours tonight. Another successful VPUB. I'll raise a glass and say slantia. Thank you all of you for your uh, generous uh, virtual drams. And I will see you in two weeks time. Slantia